Thank you everyone for coming to what should be a fascinating and topical panel discussion on the Supreme Court's vacancy and the current appointment and confirmation entanglement. Uh, my name is Zach Newkirk and I serve as co-president of the Duke Law Chapter of the American Constitution Society. Um, we are thrilled to co-host this event with the University of North Carolina's ACS chapter. Um, before I introduce our panelists, I want to mention a related event that ACS is hosting on Wednesday, uh, March 30th at 12.30 p.m. in room 3037 entitled Fix the Court. Um, we'll be co-sponsoring with the Federalist Society in what should be a lively discussion among professors Thomas Metzloff, Ernie Young, and Donald Iyer, and moderated by Gabe Roth of the organization Fix the Court about transparency and accessibility issues about the Supreme Court. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Uh, so moving down the line, Professor Neil Siegel is the David Eichel Professor of Law here at Duke and teaches American constitutional law, constitutional theory, and federal courts. In, ad in addition to Duke Law students, he teaches judges um, in Duke's Master of Judicial Studies program and offers Supreme Court updates and other talks at judicial conferences at judicial um, and uh, at law firms around the country. Professor Siegel has served as special counsel to then Senator Joe Biden on the confirmation hearings of uh, John Roberts and Samuel Alito. He was also a Bristow Fellow at the U.S. Department of Justice before clerking for Associate Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Professor Christopher Schrader is the Charles S. Murphy Professor of Law and Public Policy Studies here at Duke. Uh, he teaches on constitutional, administrative, and property law and has written extensively on federal policy making and uh, presidential powers. Among other professional experiences, he worked as Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Policy at the United States Department of Justice where he supervised the evaluation of President Obama's nomine nominees to the ju federal judiciary. Professor Schrader has also served as Acting Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Counsel, as well as Chief Counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Lastly, Professor Bill Marshall is the Kennan Professor of Law at the University of North Carolina. He teaches courses on constitutional law, federal courts, law and politics, and has written extensively on freedom of speech, freedom of religion, federal courts, presidential power, federalism, and most relevant today, judicial selection matters. He has served as Deputy White House Counsel and Deputy Assistant to the President of the United States during the Clinton administration. He has also served as the Solicitor General of the State of Ohio. Please join me in welcoming our panelists today. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Zach, and uh, thanks to all of you and to ACS uh, for, uh, for, for being here and for, for hosting this event. I did want to just uh, embellish uh, the biographies of my, my two colleagues a little more. So uh, uh, Chris uh, uh, served uh, in the, on the Judiciary Committee uh, working for then Senator Joseph Biden, really from the Bork hearings through the Thomas hearings. Uh, and so substantial uh, experience with uh, nomination and confirmation of Supreme Court justices in particular. And uh, Bill uh, worked on judicial nominations in particular at various times for, for the Clinton administration. And so we have a lot of, uh, a lot of real world experience that uh, we can, uh, we can bring, bring to bear. So let me, let me set, set the scene. Uh, we know that within hours of the death of Associate Justice Antonin Scalia, uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell uh, declared publicly that under no circumstances would the Senate consider any nominee uh, to replace Justice Scalia by President Obama. Subsequently, all 11 Republican members of the Senate Judiciary Committee announced in a letter to uh, Senate Majority Leader McConnell that they would not consider any Supreme Court nomination made by uh, Obama as well. And in the letter, uh, the Republican members said that their, quote, decision is based on constitutional principle and born of necessity to protect, end quote, the ability of the American people, quote, to decide in a very real and concrete way the direction the court will take over the next generation, end quote. So let me just begin by uh, uh, asking, uh, asking you what, what you think the Republican political strategy is here to just announce almost immediately, no, never under any circumstances, as opposed to going more slowly, sure, we'll consider, and then maybe at the end of the day, not voting to confirm. So I'm not a particular expert on Republican political strategy. Um, they certainly could have pursued a quieter 
strategy and gotten to the same place that yeah. they want to get to. That is, no confirmation hearings in 2016. Simply by slow walking whatever nomination the president put forward, they would have been aided and abetted, I believe, by the fact that it appears the West Wing has been caught flat-footed by Justice Scalia's demise. They have taken a long time to have a nomination, much longer than, well, play the counterfactual. Instead of Mitch McConnell announcing that there's not going to be any hearing on any President Obama nominee, how about a White House announcement in the Rose Garden half a day after Justice Scalia's death that has President Obama standing next to the individual that he or she, he intends to send up to the Senate, together with an explanation of the very attractive uh, qualifications, skills, experiences, life story. Mm -hmm. I think that would have changed the political environment of what McConnell then did in a very dramatic way. I think it's one thing to be, be oppositional in the abstract, but you might think that that is a worse thing to do than oppose a particular nominee, and it certainly is unprecedented. But it's hard, I think, for the public as a whole to get particularly energized about an abstract fight over whether somebody is going to get a hearing or not until there's a real person standing there, perfectly well qualified, exquisite qualifications, hopefully, very, otherwise with a very compelling life story. Think of the kind of life story that Sonia Sotomayor had. If, put her in, the, in that position and, and wonder whether the Republicans would be able to stand on the position that they've staked out. And I yet don't know whether or not they will uh, feel particular pressure once there is a nomination. But I know the longer it goes without there actually being a nomination, the, the um, harder it will be for the people who would like to have a hearing to be able to push hard enough, long enough for, their, for that to actually come to pass. I think they could have gotten there a softer way, too. I don't think it was a Republican strategy that Senator Mitch McConnell was doing when he made that announcement. I think it was a Senator Mitch McConnell strategy <laughs> that he was worried that he would be attacked from the right yeah. if he hadn't immediately opposed things and he wanted to put himself out there as fast as possible to deflect any, any criticism and any upheaval on the right because he's watched what happened with Boehner and he watched what happened with Eric Cantor. So I think McConnell was basically trying to save his own skin. I think by doing that, he harmed the overall Republican strategy because they look a lot more like obstructionists than they would have had he done the softer approach that I think Chris was, Chris was talking about, even if they came up with the same lack of a resolution at the end of the, at the, end of the year. <laughs> so if we, we look at the, the Democrats, including the President, and how they're responding, uh, right, they're saying a number of different things. They're, they're um, describing what the Republicans are doing as an abdication of constitutional responsibility. They're saying it's partisan and therefore disingenuous. Uh, there are, some are even saying that it's an attempt to demean the president. Um, what they're not saying is disputing a basic factual assumption that the Republicans are making, which is that uh, there are very high stakes here that for the first time in half a century, the court could tip from having a conservative majority to having a liberal majority. And uh, I'm wondering what you think about that. Is, there, you know, is that really an accurate assumption about what the, what, what the stakes are here? Because um, if the stakes aren't nearly as high as the Republicans are describing them, then presumably there's less special warrant to deviate from longstanding historical practice. Can you start with that? Yeah, I think, well, I think that there is a long-term issue here. I mean, I think that part, part of your point, Neil, is well taken, which is that there are going to be some other changes in the court in the next four years. So simply because one justice is replaced this year doesn't mean that the ideological change is going to be forever. So in that sense, the stakes are not quite as high as it's being described. I think for the Republican self-image, though, uh, Justice Scalia is the ultimate of icons. And so replacing him with anybody other than somebody who replicates what Justice Scalia looks like is something that they take very deeply and personally because no other 
justice, I think, has sort of demanded the kind of attention that Scalia has for the last 30 years or so. Okay. So I, I second what Bill just said. I also think that depending on the nominee, and it could be that President Obama is going to try to find a pick that in his heart of hearts he thinks is actually a consensus pick, which would mean somebody who's center or center left, but is not viewed as um, an arch progressive right. of the sort that is immediately going to move the court sharply. It still can be an indication of the nature of this appointment that you'd see the kind of gradual movement towards the left of the court mm -hmm. that we've seen since Justice Powell retired in 1986, which prompted the um, nomination of, of Judge Bork, which is a kind of gradual, not, not not discontinuous at right. any moment in time, but a series of judges who have gradually, by virtue of the fact that uh, uh, Republican presidents made a number of critical appointments in the 80s and early 90s, and then since then it has worked out that, largely speaking, like has been replacing like. Mm -hmm. So you could move in a situation, move into a condition where with this appointment plus an appointment sometime early in the term of a President Clinton, say if that came to pass, you would have established a kind of center left to left majority on the court that could then stay in place for a long time. Yeah. No, I think those are so all. So there is a large, I think there is, again, depending on the nominee, I think there is something substantial at stake right. or could be. Right. And I think those are all good points. Um, and yet, if you look at what there's, you know, now you might say this is politics. Why are you taking the arguments on both sides so seriously? But if you look at what the letter says from the Republican members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, right, the principle that they say that they're that they're trying to follow is for the American people to decide in a very real and concrete way the direction the court will take over the next generation. Right? And what I'm implying with, 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 the, with the last question is uh, that's going to happen very likely anyway, even if Obama replaces Justice Scalia. Because Justice Ginsburg is 82, and Justice Kennedy is 79, and Justice Breyer is 77. And so it's much more probable than not that the American people are going to get to decide this in the 2016 election in terms of the presidency and the Senate, regardless of what happens with this seat. And so um, right, uh, the conduct, the, the absolute refusal to consider doesn't really seem to be required uh, by the principle they think is most important to protect. I think the, we're trying to prevent any kind of a slide to the left. I think that's, I think that's right. That's not what they're saying because it seems less persuasive. Uh, there was a significant slide to the right when Justice Alito replaced Justice O'Connor a decade ago. And you know, um, I think describing this as more of a, right, a similar kind of slide in the opposite direction as opposed to a tipping point, a difference in kind, the court is now set for the next generation. It's just not, right, it just doesn't seem to me to be the case uh, that it's going to happen. To be very concrete, if the Republicans win the 2016 election and replace Justice Ginsburg, you're back to a 5-4 court with a conservative majority obviously depending in part on what happens in the Senate. If we think methodologically about how this debate is unfolding, there seems to me to be a lot of emphasis on historical practice, on what has happened in the past. How have presidents behaved? How has the Senate behaved? Uh, and first, that's just very interesting. There are fewer arguments based on the text, the original meaning of the text, although there's some of that. There's certainly no judicial precedent to talk about. Uh, and uh, I'm wondering if you agree that this is, these are sort of the terms in which the debate is unfolding. And um, to the extent you do, what's the best way to frame the question? Because from the Democratic standpoint, it's something like this. It's, you know, when's the last time, has there ever been an instance in American history in which the Senate has simply refused to consider any Supreme Court nominee uh, from a president with almost a year to go in the president's term, simply based on the identity of the president, not the nominee. From the Republican side is, when's the last time the Senate has confirmed a nominee of the opposite party during an election year? So there are different ways you can frame the relevant question with respect to practice. Which, right, which way of framing it is, is, the, is the, most, uh, the most appropriate here? 
it seems to me that the best way of framing it is that President Obama was elected for four years. So the American people have already made their choice. We're not waiting a new one. The, the presidential term is not, is not three years. It's not three and a quarter years. It's four years. And so the president has the obligation, the responsibility to put forward a particular name. What the, what the Senate can do in response to that is use its process of advice and consent to evaluate that particular nominee. But to say, as a matter of course, that it's not going to look at anybody seems to me beyond the bounds of where history has been previously. And I, I grant you that I don't think history is as clear as the Republicans are trying to say that it is. There haven't been that many of these kinds of of examples that have uh, that have that have appeared before. You mean the Democrats? Uh, well, both actually. I don't. I don't think the historical arguments are all that clear on on either side. Okay. Um, what I what I do think is clear is the idea that presidential elections work for four years. You don't keep on waiting. I mean, if Hillary Clinton gets elected, is the is the Congress going to come across in February of next year and say, well, we got to wait till the next election? Okay, but if but if uh, Justice Scalia had passed what after the election and the Republicans won, right? Do you, you're not going to stand on the text and say four years. I'm going to stand on the text and say four years that the president has a right to make the nomination if they want You might to. even say he has the duty. The, the Constitution duty. says shall, but what's the duty of the Senate in that circumstance? I think the duty of the Senate here is to advise and consent with respect to a particular nominee, not to come up and say, as a blanket matter, we're not going to consider anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's where, that's where I think Senator McConnell overplayed his hand. Um, because by just saying we're going to oppose everybody, he sort of brings the Senate out of any kind of logical, logical um, constitutional position they might otherwise have. Their, their job is to advise and consent. Their job isn't to issue preemptive strikes saying that we won't look at anybody. Mm -hmm. Although at least they have the virtue of providing clear notice to the American people <laughs> about what they're going to do. I think it is historically unprecedented. The closest analogy I can come up with is when the Reconstruction Congress decided that it did not want to hear any of Andrew Johnson's nominees. So it passed the 1866 Judiciary Act, which shrunk the court from 10 to 7. So it just eliminated three seats, guaranteeing that uh, it was highly unlikely that Andrew Johnson would make any appointments, and he didn't. Uh, obviously, they had such a majority, they, they could override Johnson's veto on, um, on that measure, and that this Congress could not do that. But absent that example, you really have to look at the lower courts, which, you know, in a way, this is kind of, what, one way to look at this question is just how special is the Supreme Court? Because, in fact, the confirmation window or door for lower court appointees has shut in an election year um, more and more regularly. The Senate has a practice that they have named the Thurman Rule, which because it was uh, f uh, frequently referred to by Senator Thrum Thurman when he was chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, that after a certain point in an election year, we're gonna just gonna stop confirming lower court judges. And as a matter of fact, sometimes just stop even holding hearings. So each four-year cycle, Court of Appeals judges and district court judge, judge uh, nominations are sent up and they just pile up in front of the door of the Judiciary Committee. And they're, they're, there's no hearings held, there are no floor votes. Uh, and that has been a practice that both parties have pursued uh, when they've been in the majority in the Senate. So in a way, with respect to lower court judges, the Senate's been acting this way for a while. Now, of course, it's never been the, this would be the earliest invocation of the Thurman Rule ever, but no one's exactly sure when the Thurman Rule is invoked or ought to be invoked because it's this kind of soft practice. It just suddenly gets much more difficult to find time on the senator's calendar to schedule Judiciary Committee hearings that are going to consider judges, and it's tougher and tougher. Uh, never been done for, for the Supremes. Uh, never behaved that way in an election year uh, yet. Uh, but if you wanted to look at judicial committee and Senate practice in this area, 
What's going on now is distinctive because the Supreme Court is so special, because there are only nine individuals, and we think that 4-4 decisions are, um, they don't constitute precedent, but they, everybody's invested a lot of work in teeing up these cases, some of them involving very important issues, and all you're going to do is kick the can down the road for want of that ninth vote. And that makes a big difference, I think, in getting the public's attention on an issue like this. That, that this is. This is the apex institution now that is being yeah. paralyzed. It's not the District of Oregon, which when I first came into the Office of Legal Policy job had six seats devoted to it on the district court, and two of them were filled. <laughs> so it was operating at a very low productivity rate and being, being helped out by the senior justices who were continuing to carry a, a workload on pretty much a voluntary basis. Never happened before on the Supreme Court. Then again, the amount of political division and pure opposition to the incumbent president's actions, whatever they might be, could well be at a all point high that has not been seen since the Reconstruction Congress and Andrew Johnson. Yeah, I'm fairly convinced that if President Obama appointed Ted Cruz to the Supreme Court. Ted Cruz would vote against it just to spite Obama. <laughs> He'd filibuster uh, himself. <clears throat> it's hard. It's hard to be president and uh, an associate justice. I mean, uh, I've looked into this a little bit, uh, at least at the, at the same time. Uh, I think the close when you when you put aside the episodes of court packing and unpacking, which took place something like seven times over the course of the first half of the 19th century, they ended in 1869. The closest analogy I could find was 1844 to 1845, and that involved a series of Tyler nominees. Mm. But it's even then, they really weren't complete refusals to consider in almost every case. They were tabled by the full Senate after a vote. They had been rejected and then confirmed. I think there were a couple that might have been refused to be considered, but I think that was, I mean, I think, I think in those instances, it was something like a few weeks before inauguration, right, after the election. And so, but that's the closest I could, I could find for what we're talking about here. And that, you know, that begs the question of whether the circumstances here are sufficiently different than anything we've seen before that, to justify the deviation from, from the practice. Now, Chris, you mentioned earlier that if, if Obama had come out with a nominee, a name, a face, a set of credentials, a compelling story early, it might have been different. Presumably, the president is going to name a nominee, and presumably, it's going to be soon. How, if at all, do you two think that the, the nature of the political debate is going to change? Or do you think it's already been set in stone and it's not going to change much? I'm thinking about, you know, I, I mean, there are different ways you could go, right? I mean, if you have someone, you could have someone who is, how do you not confirm this person? You just confirmed him or her 97 to 0. Another way to go is, how do you not even consider this person? Um, a very compelling uh, nominee who's going to really get out the vote for the Democrats in, in November if, 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 if what's perceived to be going on here is just demeaning and disrespectful. Well, I think that once you have a nominee, it'll be increasingly uh, difficult to simply maintain the abstract position. I'm not going to hear any nomination at all without also eventually having to add some reasons as to why this particular real identified person is not qualified to be on the court. And so I think that's the, if, if there's a way to change the dynamic, it it's, occurs for that reason, but only after you have an attractive figure. And of course, whether or not that is pressure or not will depend on how many uh, independents, voting independents actually subscribe to the view that this is a person who, yeah, that makes sense to me that this person be, Justice Scalia's replacement. I think if you have a, a real live name and person in front of you and people conclude, no, that's going to move the court too much, that will strengthen the Republicans' hand and say, you know, I understand why it is they're doing what they're doing. That's, that's too big a movement. So it's going to depend on the nominee. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree with, with, with what Chris is saying, except in part. I think what we've seen in the last 10 years is the change of politics away from trying to persuade the independents in the middle to just playing to the base. And so if it's a Republican there right now, it may be they could hurt themselves with independence. It may be that the strategy that McConnell is taking could cause the Republicans to lose some Senate seats. But the Republicans are more, more scared of their base than they are of independence right now. And I think that's what's leading 
to a lot of this kind of strange behavior that we're seeing is that they're not trying to persuade anybody. They're just trying to tell, other than their base, and to tell their base that they're not making any compromises because, uh, because they're afraid to do that. And I can't, the, the feat of Cantor was, was a lightning stroke for the Republicans. Yeah. And, and the kicking out of Boehner, the same thing. It's not like either one of those two were moderates. Yeah. So if you were the president, and I'm not asking you to name names, uh, just what would you be looking for in a nominee? And I don't mean in terms of, you know, qualified and, you know, the typical laundry list of, but I mean, would you be looking to serve up someone who's the most plausibly confirmable by the Republicans? Or would you be looking for someone who is eminently qualified, you'd like to have the person on the court, but is really going to get out the vote uh, in the next election? I don't think I don't think the same nominee is going to do both equally well. Do you want me to go? Or do you want to go? That's why we paid you the big bucks. Oh, that's home. right. That's right. I, I got to talk to you guys about the mileage cost coming <laughs> up here afterward. Um, I would do the moderate, I think, because I think that one of the interesting things I, I think the Republican base is more excited by the Supreme Court than the Democratic base is, or at least that's traditionally been true. Particularly, by the way, it's not just a question of, of, of choice and racial issues, it's guns. I mean, guns really motivates the Republican, the Republican base. Um, so I think anybody who looks like they're going to cut back on Hiller is going to really, really enliven the Republican, the Republican base. Where a moderate person will both give the sense that, that the president is doing something moderate and he's trying to take the statesmanlike approach um, and although it will, might not have as much effect of getting the Democratic base out, it looks to me like the Democratic base is going to be motivated pretty much by just who the Republican nominee is going to be. So I'm not sure you need, you need much more additional on, on that particular thing, whereas the message being sent to the country about a moderate is, is I think, a good one. The other thing to think about here, and I want to talk too long, but the other thing to think about is the effect of this on the next cycle, because if a Democrat gets elected, the, the uh, McConnell and company have boxed themselves in pretty seriously about the kind of person that, the, uh, that, they can, that they can oppose, because they will then have to concede that, okay, the election happened, we have to defer in a particular way. The Democrats won't have to face that, by the way. They will still be able to oppose as harshly as, as much as they can, because they haven't been saying that this election should be the referendum. So I agree with almost everything Bill said. Um, I do think the way to understand what the leadership of the Senate is doing is to look at the relationship with their base and not with independents. I think so. I do think the only way to mount significant public uh, outcry is with a nominee who does appeal to independents. And so it's not just a base versus base kind of dispute. But whether or not that will be successful, I've grown more and more dubious that there's actually any strategy that the president could follow or any nominee that he could put forward that mm -hmm. would change the dynamic that has been started. Mm -hmm. I will say as to whether or not the leadership and Senator McConnell in particular has committed himself to not oppose a particular kind of nominee afterwards, this is an area that is the Senate's role in the confirmation process as to which no senator is guilty of consistency. They've all changed their mind on, on any number of issues related to whether should, there should be hearings or whether you should look for a moderate or, a, or someone uh, closer to their political position or whether it's appropriate to take judicial philosophy into account or whether it isn't, depending on who the president in power is and what you think about the merits of the nominee that's before the court. So they'll find a way to, to act in their political interest no after, doubt. No doubt. after mm. the election, regardless of what the letter said. <laughs> no doubt. So how do, you, how do you two see this playing out? Uh, what's it going to look like, uh, say, January, you know, I don't know, it's January 1, 2016, and uh, will, will, will Justice Scalia's seat uh, still, be, still be open? Yeah, if I had to bet, I would say yes, it would still be open, which means it's essentially going to be open for close to two years. Yeah. Or the summer, the summer of 17, we'll have a replacement. I'd have, to, I'd have to agree with that. Um, the Republicans don't call me up for strategy either. <laughs> but, um, uh, and they certainly wouldn't follow the strategy I'm about to suggest. But the interesting thing is, is that this would really be the appropriate time 
for a true centrist to be nominated to the Supreme Court in a way that might benefit the court as a whole, um, rather than just seeing two different blocks, but to have an actual centrist there. And this seems to me the optimum time. If, if the Democrats win the election, the pressure from their base is not going to be to appoint a moderate. If the Republicans win, their pressure from their base is not going to be to appoint a moderate. We're actually at a point where it makes sense for a, for a moderate, and probably it's a good time for a real centrist to come to the court to try to take away some of the politicization that we've seen in the, uh, in the court for the last um, 10 years. So it sounds like the most likely scenario uh, is that uh, President Obama is not going to successfully nominate anyone for this seat. What's, is there any scenario in which that can change? So imagine it becomes clear who the Republican nominee for president is, who the Democratic nominee is, and the polling suggests quite strongly that the Democrats are going to win. Could you imagine a scenario which at that point, through back channels, McConnell says, here's a list of names, choose from this list. Right, and we'll reconsider. Because it's a high risk strategy, right? Because um, you could end up losing much bigger after, right, after the election. Is that, is that a possibility or is it just going to be the base is what the base is and it's just not going to happen? I don't think that's a possibility. When is Senator McConnell up again in 20? Yeah. He'd lose that election? Yeah. Uh, he'd be primaried in his home state with somebody from the Tea Party who would win the primary and he'd be out. All right, so then what are the longer term institutional implications? So is one implication here that you can forget about the, syllab the filibuster for Supreme Court nominations if they're willing to do this? What party in control of the Senate is going to allow a filibuster of their own, you know, of a nominee? Um, what if the Republicans win the presidency and the Democrats control the Senate after 2016? Can you imagine circumstances in which the Democrats are going to vote to confirm? A Republican nominee to the Supreme Court when they think that and uh, right that this was actually their seat. I mean, so are we now going to be at the point in which the new normal is that in order to put anyone on the court, you have to control both the White House and the Senate? Is that hysterical or is that where we're heading? In other words, we have to preserve the ability of the American people to choose the future direction of the court in 2020. I think the window for cooperation across party lines, if the scenario that we both have sketched out is the one that comes to pass, will be shortened. I mean, we, will, we will de facto have taken the fourth year off of the president's option list mm -hmm. when the Senate is in opposing hands. I still think that in the early years of a presidency, um, it would be very difficult to conceive of the Senate deciding to stonewall the president's nomination for multiple years in a kind of open-ended fashion. But is it, this, this is another ratchet in what is increasingly a one-way ratchet. It had stalled for a while. We thought that the whole process was, had been sort of blown up in terms of the amount of political conflict it could generate by the nomination fight over Robert Bork. Things sort of stabilized, but they were still contentious. I mean, the number of dissenting votes for any nominee since Thomas has been very hot. And so there's continual opposition whenever any, any Supreme Court vacancy arises. I think that this situation we're in now over the replacement for Justice Scalia is just another downward ratchet. And it never ceases to amaze me how creative the opposing parties can be in finding ways to, to say payback. But I can't imagine the Democrats will lie down on this, nor can I imagine the Republicans becoming suddenly much more cooperative than they are at this moment. Okay. Well, I have more questions, but I'm not going to ask them because I want to hear from you folks. You must have questions. It could be about law. It could be about politics. It can be about conventions. What's, what's on your mind with respect to this, to this vacancy? Yes. So I know that a lot of uh, scholars were tapping Sri Srinivasan to be President Obama's potential pick before um, Justice Scalia's death. Do you think that Judge, uh, Judge Srinivasan would be a viable choice now? Is he centrist enough to be able to attract bipartisan support and possibly get rid of this kind of Republican blockade in the Senate? Well, if you just looked at paper and track record, you would think the answer to that would be yes. He received, uh, to the extent he received opposition as 
when he was being nominated to the Court of Appeals, it was from people on the left who were concerned that he had worked for O'Melveny and Myers for too long and represented the Chamber of Commerce and didn't have the bona fides that people like to look for in somebody who's obviously had been placed on the court in order to help qualify him for an eventual um, Supreme Court position or, or add to the bench strength of Democratic jurists who would be relatively attractive to uh, put forward. But in this environment, I'm not sure that President Obama, I think it would, it's gonna be difficult for President Obama to actually nominate anyone who the Republicans will concede as a moderate. So they will paint that person as unacceptable because they're moving the court too much since that's the argument that they have put forward as the reason why they're opposing. He clerked for J. Harvey Wilkinson III and Justice O'Connor, two Republican appointees. He was confirmed by the Republican Senate in 2013-97 to zero. If he is nominated, you will hear broad, bipartisan in the sense of the legal community support um, from former solicitors general of, of both parties. I mean, he is widely um, um, admired and, and just liked by really everyone I've ever, ever encountered. But, um, uh, and, and he doesn't have that much of a paper trail on hot button issues, which is also particularly, particularly important here. That said, I think the but, dynamic is still. Yeah, they, but they've said what they've said, and, um, um, uh, and so it, it seems. Uh, um, yeah, it doesn't, um, it just doesn't, you know, uh, there would have to be something about naming the person who's on everyone's short list and, you know, uh, was, you know the Republicans know who's on this list and it's, it's not at all changing what they're saying. So um, um, it doesn't seem, uh, he's also a big, uh, big college basketball fan, although for Kansas, not for, not for Duke. Anyway. Uh, so the, I want to mention just something about the current dynamic that we're in. So for years, people in the Senate who have wanted to make sure that the role of the senators receives the respect that the senators think it should receive have always said advice and consent includes advice. So the way the process should work is the chairman of the committee, maybe the ranking member, maybe it's a bipartisan meeting, should actually talk with the president ahead of time, and they should confer. And they might even both come into this meeting with lists, and they would see if there's a common name. And if not, maybe they go out and do some more work and then come back to a meeting and talk more. Now, for a long time, that's been resisted, of course, by presidents, as you can imagine they might. We're now in this odd situation where that's what President Obama is inviting. Yeah. <laughs> and Senator Grassley and Senator McConnell have met with President Obama in the Oval Office at least once. And my understanding is that's the conversation that has been invited by the president, and the senators will say, we don't want to do that. Yes. <laughs> we don't want to actually give you advice, except don't send us any nominees. So it's a very interesting institutional flip right. that they've put themselves in as a result of taking this position. Right, and, and actually, I mean, the Constitution says shall, right? So there's a very strong argument that that the president is under a constitutional obligation to make a nomination, and that's being characterized by uh, Leader McConnell as gratuitously balkanizing the country during a time in which we're already polarized, right, that um, really spare us, um, right, spare us further unnecessary conflict. And so they don't want to, they don't want to play, they don't want to, um, right, we're not, we're not just not going to play, we're not going to show up, right, um, and we're certainly not going to bring a ball with us. It's just uh, uh, see us, see us after January. Other questions? Yes? You did mention that we have several Supreme Court justices that are old, and Roberts has already had heart attacks. What happens if something else happens? What happens if we lose another justice? Do you think they'll still leave the court with down two for a year? I think that would strengthen the Republican position because now you have an odd number of justices. <laughs> and so don't talk to us about 4-4 four, four splits, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't... Um, I don't see that changing things before the election. Um, I agree. In, uh, uh, now, um, if it's, um, you know, it might depend on which justice it is, and, you know, if it were uh, a, a Democratic appointee, 
um, maybe the Republicans would say, let's cut a deal. We get to choose one and you get to choose one or something like that. But, you know, I, I don't know. I'm just at this point just making, making stuff up. I think, if it, you know, uh, the most likely scenario is now we've got an odd number of justices and it's all the more reason to wait and let the American people choose. Yes. Yeah. Is there any mechanism for um, almost suing for, for some kind of specific performance to force the Senate to do its job? And that's almost like asking, is there a mechanism for going to the Supreme Court for an advisory opinion? As in, this has never happened before. We're on constitutionally very strange ground. It's, it reminds me of the recess appointments case to some extent, except there the president had taken action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the, the advisory opinion answer is easy, that's no, right? There's no opportunity for an advisory opinion, but it, it is a version of the question that I would have asked with more time, which is what's a president to do in this circumstance? Is there anything the president can do, including, you know, is there anyone who would have standing to sue? Um, and, and, you know, what exactly, who would have standing and what exactly would the cause of action look like? And, uh, would, a, and then would a federal court, even if you can answer all those questions, uh, be willing to what you know order the Senate to to do its job, so to speak. Even though um, you know that's very much what's at it. What what's at, what is, what's that issue? Good luck with that one. I think I, I don't think there's much of a shot for that. What there is a possibility for, and might not happen right now, but it might happen if the somebody said the worst case scenario. We keep on getting the worst case scenario. It doesn't uh, seem just when we think it can't get worse. It might be helpful at some point for the Justice Roberts, the Chief Justice Roberts, to speak out and to talk about the institutional needs of the judiciary and to argue that that should be a reason to tone down some of this polarization there because uh, occasionally that's worked previously when there have been various kinds of delays. But if the uh, judiciary spoke as an institution, that might be helpful. I don't think that's going to change the dynamic here, but if it keeps on getting worse, maybe. Yeah, that might have an effect. Good luck with that as well. <laughs> you can't see that happening in this environment. Yeah. So, Professor Trader, you said uh, in your first answer that um, the White House was caught flat-footed. So I'm wondering how the heck could that possibly happen? How, how would they not have a process in place where they can get a nominee within, I don't know, a week or two weeks of the death of the Supreme Court Justice? So I can only speculate about the, you know, the, the detailed explanation for this. Um, but from all external angles, it looks like they just, most of the time, White House counsel will run an operation that includes keeping a relatively up-to-date short list. And then when a nomination appears, the search, of course, is, and the inquiries and the consultations are greatly expanded. But you've got a starting point. And from the number and diversity of names that have been floated around as possible replacements, and now the amount of time that has passed, uh, it doesn't seem like that was occurring now. And as I say, there could be, ex there could be plausible sort of micro explanations for it. I mean, we replaced the White House counsel who had taken a very active interest in, uh, in nominations and who had been uh, uh, shepherded the two Supreme Court nominations through. There was this quiet period. There wasn't any expectation that anybody was going to resign. You replace the White House counsel with somebody whose focus was much more on the kind of oversight and congressional inquiry aspect of the White House counsel's job. So you didn't, and the, the people who were part of the White House judge picking operation in the first term and through half of the second term have departed. You've replaced them with new people who I think, again, did not come in with a kind of muscle memory that this is something they had to, to keep doing. And it's, there's a lot of things you've got to do when you're in the White House counsel's office. And <laughs> there are other ways that you're filling up your day productively. And I think they just didn't think hard, focus hard enough on what if this happened. And so they weren't ready to go. At least that's what it looks like from the outside. Well, and part of what, you know, I worked there. The, the number one rule there is you're constantly sacrificing the important for the urgent. Yeah. Uh, you develop files, you look at people, and there is some sort of backlog there, I mean, some sort of repository of people that you might look at. But that takes a whole new significance when it actually becomes real. 
probably Sri wasn't asked for his third grade essays uh, when he went up to the Court of Appeals, but he, but he would be now if it's the United States Supreme Court. I mean, it just elevates the amount of preparation that you have to do so that it would be really impossible to get somebody ready that quickly. It's also, also there's so many different scenarios there. Uh, Justice Scalia's vacancy is a different vacancy than Justice Ginsburg's vacancy in terms of what you might look at in, in pushing somebody forward. So I gotta defend the White House here. It's yeah. a really impossible to be ready to turn it around that quickly. And particularly given the amount of scrutiny this is gonna get, they have to, do checks and cross checks like we've never seen before if they're going well, before they come up with a nominee here. And if, again, in further fairness to the White House, this process works most seamlessly when the justice has given a heads up to the White House that they're about to step down. And obviously that didn't happen. Yeah. But just to be clear, we're neither confirming nor denying the existence of uh, any third grade essays by uh, <laughs> <laughs> I saw a hand in the back. Yeah, so, I mean, who basically agrees to be shark bait at this point anyway, um, <laughs> given especially that a failed Supreme Court confirmation process can be pretty disastrous to an individual's sort of career? Yeah, and, and let me, let me, that's a great question. And if someone makes him or herself available now, is that effectively disqualifying for the next president, or is it, can you see a scenario in which the person would be re-nominated? Because that could also be part of what's going on is actually people not wanting to do it now, given the. I think that probably is complicating the situation. I can see a scenario in which uh, the person would be renominated, and that's if. You said would be? Would be. Yeah. And that is if the name becomes an object of attention on the campaign trail, the way that Republicans have said they want it to be, in effect. Let the American people decide. So Hillary Clinton embraces whoever this person is with full vigor and. and says on that, as part of some debate that she's going to renominate th this person if the Senate continues to be recalcitrant. Mm -hmm. And then she's elected. And then she is going to renominate him. So that's the scenario under which you wouldn't be throwing away your one chance at a Supreme Court ticket. Otherwise, though, I think you've got to, of course, that doesn't necessarily have to happen. You could be vilified and character assassinated in the period of time that you're standing before the American public and, yeah. and the Republican opposition, and, and your, current, your currency could go be heavily devalued. Yeah, and part of the face-saving after the election could be if the Democrats are still in the White House and the Republicans are still in the Senate, we're going to agree you're not going to send me that person again. It's going to be someone else. Right. right? That, could, I mean, it's, that could happen, too. Yeah. yeah. So it's very complicated for the nominee. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I wanted to ask, you used the term like moderate, moderate, centrist, and independence when talking about political, but in this political atmosphere, um, along the two prongs of both in political, in the political sphere and in constitutional law, do those people still exist? Do moderates and independents and centrists still exist? Or are they, are they now people who no longer have the courage to like look through their convictions to see how things fall? Is, is that what's happening now in a polarized society? That to say uh, you're moderate in constitutional law is simply to say you don't look at the full fallout of your opinions. And like you must pick a side now. I do think those people still exist. Um, a year ago, I, uh, Neil brought up the name of J. Harvey Wilkinson. I, I, he's much more conservative than I am, but J. Harvey Wilkinson's willing to go to results that are not necessarily consistent with his political choices. Um, and there are jurists out there. I think there are people who really value the craft of the law. And that's what I mean by a moderate. I mean, uh, a friend of mine who teaches con law once said that if you have a constitutional theory that justifies all your political results, you do not have a constitutional theory. And I'm afraid too many people are getting appointed on the results part and not on, the, uh, not on their commitment to the idea of the rule of law. But yeah, I do think that there are there are some out there. I think from everything I know about Sri, he's one, and Patty Millette's another one, um, that there are some folks out there who can't really be accused of letting the politics decide where their decisions are going. And you could just, I mean, just, you know, think about your own experience in a constitutional law class with your classmates. I mean, there are a spectrum of views, uh, oftentimes, that we somewhat oversimplifying, but nonetheless, uh, right, uh, accurate enough for most reasonable purposes, you can you can you know you can plot a spectrum of views along right from left to right 
Um, it could be, you know, affirmative action is categorically uh, prohibited by the Equal Protection Clause to uh, it's categorically permissible to, it actually depends upon the circumstances and the setting and how it's done. I mean, you know, uh, I don't think you know, there are no people uh, who think that affirmative action is a genuinely difficult issue uh, and there are going to be uh, sort of more and less constitutionally defensible versions of it. Uh, you can say similar things about the court's abortion <laughs> jurisprudence, or you can say some things about the court's federalism jurisprudence, right? I mean, I, um, to me, it's, uh, it's more common, I think, in, in law than it is in our politics today to find people with more middle-of-the-ground legal positions who might realize um, the extent to which reasonable people can, can disagree. I think there are meaningful differences among justices on the le you know, within the left on the court and within the right on the court. I think there are non-trivial differences among, among the justices in this, in this regard. Uh, uh, only in the back. Yes. I know Professor Siegel didn't ask you to name names, but have you guys thought about any potential nominees? Other than uh, Professor Siegel, which is way at the top of my list. Right. Exhibit A of someone who's written way too much, <laughs> things that matter too much. Well, you know, I said that in part to invite one of you to ask them to name names. <laughs> I have actually not thought about individuals in all candor too much yeah. about this. Yeah, well. I think, of, I, I think there's a logical group of people. If you're, if you're looking at the moderate road at, at, the, at the, what I think people are anticipating that the president's going to do to appoint somebody who would be considered to be a a moderate, then, then I only call him Shree because I can never pronounce his last name correctly. But, but Shree is clearly there. Patricia Millette, who, who went to the uh, D.C. Court of Appeals, is another one. Um, I was intrigued by the name of Brian Sandoval being tossed out there, the governor of Nevada for a while. Uh, it's an interesting way of playing that. That would have been a real roll of the dice, by the way. But, uh, but that would be one to try to capture Republicans or at least embarrass Republicans if they didn't want to go in that particular, if they if they were going to take this absolutely no line, but those are the those are the kinds of names. I don't think we'll see a senator. So people talked about uh, Amy Klobuchar or Sheldon Whitehouse. I don't think we'll see that because it'll be too easy for the Republicans to oppose those two. Although I think they're both very qualified, and just saying those are purely political ones. So I think some of the names you've heard are the logical ones. I mean, I work with. Shree and Patty at the SG's office, and they are both just unbelievable lawyers and people. Um, and on the merits, I think would be very difficult uh, to uh, to oppose. But you know, um, Loretta Lynch is a moderate. Um, yeah. Got a nice profile as a career prosecutor. I think the fact that she's in the Obama administration is yeah. probably fatal to her actually being a nominee. But yeah. she would otherwise fit the bill. She's yeah, she would be a third person on my on my list as, as well. Uh, I saw another hand. Yes. Do you see the court trying to actively avoid 4-4 four, four decisions while this is being made? Mm -hmm. uh, will people just sort yes. of? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think they do. I think they will. Um, doesn't mean they'll always succeed. You can try and be more narrow to get a majority. You can set cases free argument. You can dig cases, dismiss them as improvidently granted. Um, um, it's probably going to inform their selection process. Uh, we saw during the time when uh, they really, both sides held their fire when the process, the long drawn out process of replacing Justice O'Connor was in place and there was more consensus and less. Um, so, you know, I, I, they're not going to always be able to succeed, especially this term because they didn't anticipate it. But I, that's what I suspect will happen is they'll make, they'll make some, uh, they'll make some effort because it doesn't really, to affirm by an equally divided court, you, you know, you just may as well have, it's not precedent, the lower court ruling stands, you may as well have just not granted cert. It's the same result without nearly as much work for everyone involved. Um, and so that would be my instinct. Yeah, me too. Let me ask, uh, we're, we're almost out of time. I mean, if we haven't, uh, I mean, it's, if you just look at the big picture and you're saying, okay, we're actually gonna create a constitutional system um, and we're gonna do it with what we know in the present. Is this really any way um, to set up a constitutional system, which is s issues of great legal, political, social significance turns on you know, 
how well a certain justice takes care of himself. What are his eating habits? Is he really looking after his health? Does another justice's first cancer save her from her second cancer because she gets checked so regularly? Right? I mean, we're going to put you there when you're in your 40s and you're going to live until your 80s or your 90s. Um, and because there's such infrequent turnover, there's going to be so much at stake, right? at least in part. You know, I mean, what are some, you know, wouldn't term limits make a whole lot of sense? 18-year, non-renewable terms. Every two years, the most senior justice leaves the court and the president nominates and the Senate confirms. And it's regular and predictable, and both sides have a huge incentive not to go sort of um, partisan crazy because it can come back to hurt them in the very near future. Yes. No. <laughs> no. Yes and no. OK, why not? Because I thought I was going to get two yeses, and then the next question is going to be, is there any remote chance of amending the Constitution? And then I thought the answer would be. <laughs> no. Yeah. All right, so why? So, so you don't want term limits. You want, you I do want, not want term limits. You and want the life tenure. I want life tenure. And the reason why I don't want term limits is I don't want the Supreme Court to be an issue in every single presidential election. Because I think there is something called a rule of law. And the message that the Supreme Court is up for grabs in every single presidential election sends the message that law is much more political than it, sh than it should be. Now, the counter response to that is, it is that political, just admit it. But I don't think so. I think relating to the question in the back of the room, I think there is at least, I think telling justices that they can vote their politics uh, is different than saying they sometimes do vote their politics in pursuit of something else. And when you say they can vote their politics, it's a green, it's a green light to decide a case differently than they might if they were told that their major job is to figure out what the law is. Mm -hmm. And so I think term limits sends the exact wrong message about what constitutional law is. And I know I'm in a, I know I'm not just in a minority on this on this panel, I'm in a minority with a lot of legal scholars who've done some serious look at this, but I, I, I don't think it's the way to go. And I think it would work in exactly the opposite direction, that knowing that every president would have two appointments and knowing then that the court is not going to be static. A lot of us who were my age and even considerably longer lived through this period of time in which there was 11 years between mm -hmm. a vacancy. The court was exactly the same during that period of time. We've seen justices who have sat on the court for 30, 34, 35 years. I think there's a certain insularity to <laughs> sitting on the Supreme Court that doesn't um, aid in their ability to appreciate certain arguments that are being made before them and that, so that a turnover would improve that aspect and the quality of their decisions. I think there might be a tendency, I hope there would be, if, to, to diversify the professional background of the court if it was turning over more regularly. Mm -hmm. And sure, the Supreme Court ought to be important in presidential elections, and it, I, but I think it may be getting too important because of this sense, although you point out rightly that it is statistically inaccurate to think that this appointment is going to change the court permanently. There is this sense that there's a huge amount riding on each appointment right. because there's this unknown about when the next one is going to occur. And right. if you could regularize that, you would diminish the political aspect of the job. So this is a useful disagreement. We're, we're about to close. So the idea is, is term limits a potential solution to now partisan dysfunction in the political branch that's spilling over to the court, right? We, we, we may be looking at a year or two in which we don't have a full complement of justices. And what I think Bill is putting on the table is you know, his concerns about the extent to which a crude legal realism becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you keep sending the message that law is politics, it becomes politics, right? And the other side of that is, well, you know, give me an account of law that realism can accept is true, right? Which is, what should we keep sending the message that law, constitutional law made by this constitutional court um, is fundamentally different than what it actually is? And I think that's, right, that's just an ongoing dilemma in, uh, in the modern history of legal, legal thought. So we'll have to leave it at that. Uh, I want to thank you, Chris and Bill, and thank you all for being here, and thank the American Constitution Society for hosting this event.